It's a joint issue. So Stroma, do you want to just take? Yes, take I, I'll, um, I'll I'll kick off, and and I'll just um, join Paula in warmly welcoming everybody here to this um, HYS coffee chat. It seems a bit strange because I can't see any of you, but um, I understand that you are there somewhere listening to us all. Um, and we've got our HYS chat today about gender and water insecurity. And um, I'm convening it because I have a project together with Paula, which is looking specifically at that. Um, so um, Paula and I came together to look at um, specifically HYS plus gender based violence. We met through the HYS um, networking and since then Paula's got a job at um, Chicago at Loyola University. Um, and she will be able to tell herself, um, you know, a bit about herself. But we're also joined today by well, one of our colleagues on that project um, is um, Abby uh, Salmon. Um, Abby, somebody else will fill me in on the all the extras. Um, and she introduced us to Belen from her university, um, and Belen. Um, combines looking at architecture together with these issues of water insecurity. So we've got um, a really different uh, perspective coming at it um, from there. And um, she'll be able to tell you all about um, the, the projects that she's involved in. Um, and she's now come to join me in the UK to do a PhD or finish her PhD um, miles away in the cold, wet northeast. But it's cold and wet in the southeast as well today, Ellen. So um, we're in um, familiar climatic territories, no shortage of water whatsoever. It's rained nonstop for too long in our summer. And um, our, the, the third person joining us for our chat today is Charlene Collins, um, who is a second year student at Tulane in the US. And she's been doing work specifically looking at um, women and children. Um, different continent from um, mine and Paula's and Belen's work. Uh, Paula and I work in Southeast Asia and Latin America. Belen works in um, Latin America too. So we've got um, an, an African perspective on um, this topic. So I hope we're going to be able to have a, a really nice um, chat. As you know, the way these chats go is I just um, fire off the questions so I get the easy job and um, they get to do the, the answering of the questions. Um, if you, um, I presume we've got the question and answer function available. So um, please use it, um, use the chat. Um, please be participative and get involved in the conversation, all right? Um, with, it's not supposed to be presentations. OK, so um, stick your hand up, join us for a chat. Um, we really hope you will share your opinions um, on things. We want to learn from you. Um, it's part of our own learning journey. So um, please join in. But um, we thought we might just um, kick off with um, our own experiences of the most pressing issues related to water insecurity and women's health. I don't know um, who would like to um, um, start with that one. Perhaps I'll throw it over to you, Shaleen, because you're on my screen that way. And um, we'll go round the screen. Um, but yeah, what would, what would, for you, what were the most press, the worst things you found out, the most pressing issues that need to be sorted? Sure. So I think that um, to sort of contextualize that question, I think um, my own inquiry into water insecurity among um, women and children or, you know, specifically in the first 1000 days. So from pregnancy to two years postpartum really started when um, we were doing food insecurity research in Kenya and we're asking women in a qualitative way, tell us about how you feed um, your infant and sort of what are the barriers um, for infant feeding for you. And women said, you keep asking us about food, but you're not asking us about water. And so so that really kicked off our um, our you know 
our desire to start asking women about water um, and kind of dig deeper into this topic. So um, in, in diving deeper into it, um, some of the things that we found are um, in, you know, sort of alignment with what other scholars have found that women are disproportionately um, charged with carrying water, um, with fetching it, you know, from sometimes distant and precarious sources, um, that often they are also in charge of intra-household distribution. So, you know, they have to not only bear the physical responsibility of carrying water, um, but also the, the psychosocial and emotional burden of distributing it and um, being responsible for it within the household. So if you think about um, the pathways by which women just, you know, live their daily lives in areas um, where water insecurity is, is moderate or even, you know, moderate to severe, it really impacts every aspect, right? So preventing, you know, precluding women from engaging in income generating activities because they're fetching water or because they're engaging in water intensive domestic chores. Um, you can really think about how, um, how this is, an issue that's sort of cross-sector and cross-cutting. Belen, what were the, um, for you, the most pressing issues that you came across when you were exploring this topic? Uh, well, also too, thank you for the invitation. Um, and I guess it's also important for me to contextualize my work. So I work in the Amazon rainforest, which is, Ironic, because you would think uh, that the Amazon rainforest doesn't have any water problems because it's the place where it rains the most in the world. Um, but actually, uh, since we have very limited ways of providing water and sanitation in cities, which is mostly done through traditional systems of like water pipes, um, and that uh, solution is not really adaptable to an area of the world where you have monsoons, you have changing uh, river courses all the time. So, and, and also the level of urbanization in the last years, like decades have re-increased. So the government is unable to be able to provide uh, water and sanitation to new settlements. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways and new technologies that um, include rainwater provision uh, which is not contemplated in Peruvian law at the moment. Uh, and how can that water be treated so it can be used? Uh, and I think one of the main challenges that we have faced is that you should really have to close the water cycle for people that are uh, trying to access water. So it's just not being able to go and fetch water in secure places, as Shalim was saying, but also how they dispose of that water, because that also brings um, health issues. So for instance, if they just throw the water directly after usage, you get mosquitoes, which brings diseases like dengue or um, malaria and other, other diseases. So you really have to think in a technological way, how can that cycle be completed? And, but in ways that is both uh, accessible to the people, so with accessible technology, accessible materials, um, and ways that can be maintained over time also. Um, by them. So we're, it's like a dual way in which we're trying to understand what are the challenges, but also everyday activities and traditional, uh, traditional activities that women carry out in water collection and water usage, and also trying to produce political incidents in seeing how these technological innovations can be included in planning so that they are better, uh, better able to respond to Amazonian cities. Mm -hmm that the infrastructure doesn't break thing came up for us as well. But um, Paula, tell them more about our project and what we found to be the most pressing issues. Yeah, I would love to. So uh, just for a reintroduction, my name is Dr. Paula Sky Tallman. I'm a biocultural anthropologist and I'll be starting at Loyola University in Chicago this fall. And I was so lucky to meet Dr. Cole through the HYS network. Um, very much like Belen, I have done my research in the Peruvian Amazon and I was surprised to find that despite it being one of the wettest places on earth, water insecurity is a real concern because of contamination, pollution and too much and then um, too little water and then as well well as access for different parts of the population, depending on where you live within these communities. And so my research among the Awahoon pushed me into um, an interest in water insecurity. And Dr. Cole and I came together for a British Academy bid 
where we propose to investigate whether there is a relationship between water insecurity and gender-based violence in both Peru and in Indonesia. And I'll let Dr. Cole discuss a little bit about the impetus for what informed that hypothesis between water insecurity and gender-based violence. But just to answer this question, um, building off of what Shaleen said, you know, women are very much charged with, with carrying water, with the intra-household distribution of water, and women are the ones who are taking on most of the burden for reproduction. And so we're talking about pregnancy, birthing, small children, larger children. And so I think one of the most pressing issues is to understand how those two intersections of differential burdens are coming together to create excessive stress and excessive dangers to women's health and to children's health as well. And I think we really need to be thinking about this 1,000 days pregnancy through age two and how that aligns with sustainable development goals, for example, to reduce stunting and malnutrition. And Shaleen, you can talk about this a little bit, but when we look at the pillars of these development goals, right, which have to do typically with food, water and food and also with illness. I think, Shaleen, you can talk about that a bit. Water underlies all of it. And so we can't just be thinking in little segments, but more in a holistic perspective and about how water is part of this larger system of improving people's lives. Definitely. I yeah, agree. Shaleen, did you want to talk a little bit about um, what we spoke about, about the malnutrition. Sure. Bit. Yeah. So um, just, I probably should have sort of given a small introduction, but um, I'm a registered dietitian by training. I have my master's in public health nutrition. Um, and, and now I'm getting my PhD um, also in public health. So um, I sort of come at water insecurity from uh, food insecurity and nutrition perspective, um, which has, um, I think, been really interesting and illuminating in thinking about, um, you know, the traditional um, pathways by which um, malnutrition among children occurs. You really can think back to that like 1980s UNICEF framework of food, health, and care. Um, those are the three pathways by which children typically become malnourished, right? So if you think about um, water insecurity in, in the role that it plays across those pathways, you can really think about, you know, food and water are inextricably linked. Um, I've heard many times in my work in Kenya that, um, and other places as well, that people have to choose sometimes between purchasing food or purchasing water in areas where they can't access clean water. Um, you know, they'll, they'll pur purchase food um, or purchase water instead of purchasing food or purchase less water intensive foods um, to make sure that they have enough of both in their households. Um, you can see the ways that that would impact complementary feeding, for example, if you can't um, purchase, you know, good um, healthy foods to feed your baby or if you're using dirty water for example to prepare complementary foods um, that sort of impacts both food and care right if you're um, having you know the overlap of, of um, infectious diseases because kids are consuming dirty water right um, and then as far as health we know that water um, insecurity is linked to health right we know that um, people who drink dirty water do get sick. We know that um, people who bathe with dirty water can get, um, you know, rashes. Um, there are colleagues of mine who've done extensive work on schistosomiasis um, from people bathing with dirty water or going into rivers to fetch water. Um, so you can really see how there's a lot of um, overlap between food insecurity and water and how water um, insecurity can lead to malnutrition, especially among uh, the most vulnerable in the population. So kids under five, um, yeah, and I think it's also um, probably affects pregnancy and affects the development of babies in vitro. You know, um, certainly some of the stories from the women about how hard it is to do the walk, to collect the water um, when they're heavily pregnant. And, um, you know, the, 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 chances of giving birth early um, and premature birth um, because of the strains put on them and then we know that feeds through um, to all kinds of further health implications for those children um, later on in life and so I think that the, I think the link with um, um, stunting is um, very clear I think there's also um, the, the link with violence. Um, the project came about because my research is um, into how um, tourism, tourists, overuse of water detrimentally affects local communities. 
and I was researching this. I've been researching it in Indonesia for, for many, many um, years. And um, I was researching it in eastern Indonesia, where I've been doing research for a very long time. And tourism started to boom. And I noticed the effect on the women. And um, I just had an inclination because of the um, uprise in um, gender based violence being reported. Is it just because women are getting braver and reporting it more often or is it because of the additional strains that are being put on those women um, to find water? And when I talked with Oxfam about it, they said, like me, they they thought that this was the case, but there wasn't any evidence for it. Um, so that's why that was the birth of um, Paula, Gabby, Titi and my project. And it's Indonesia because that's where I've been researching for a long time. And it's Peru because that's where um, Paula has been researching and because of her connections with um, Gabby at PCUP. Um, and so we, we wanted to find out if there was any evidence or if it was just a hunch that um, and, and one of the things um, linked to the children is that we are seeing these children learning and, and, and absorbing that violence, being around that violence, the normalization of um, violence, the, the grouchy, angry, stressed out and how that overflows into violence and also um, violence directed at the children. Um, because, you know, as water carriers, non, you know, not getting their water, using too much water, um, et cetera, et cetera, and the kind of violence that they are subjected to as a consequence. Um, so it definitely spills from, from mother to children without a doubt. Um, if it, perhaps we should move on to, to some of the barriers um, to... The, improvements what why how come after all these years are we still uh, not a very good place what what's stopping it from getting better uh belen do you want to start on this one um yeah and i think actually like complimented what uh you were talking about for it's just i think one of the main problems that i see uh because i'm more focused on like the delivery of that infrastructure that provides water is that all of these everyday instances or like more qualitative data or like um, traditions and, and like the differentiated access and, um, um, and use of the streets and, and the territory between like women, children and men, it's all rendered invisible in how uh, planning and infrastructure is thought, right? So it's very quantitative, very technocratic, um, just numbers in which there's no clear difference in how then those daily experiences um, are, hurt, are, are held, right? So I think that's one of the main characteristics. And it's also like quite sectorial. So it's just my job is to provide water, but I am not entirely sure of what that entails in the everyday, like for cooking, for um, sanitation, for washing up clothes for uh, livelihoods. So by the lack of that connection and also by um, bringing over um, solutions or technologies that are not adapted to particular territories, you end up with um, yield form um, solutions that are not then properly used by the people or that they're not even being able to be implemented in the first place because they're impossible to do that in places like the Amazon rainforest. So I think for us, it's very important to start to bring up the multidimensionality of infrastructure and not only like in a physical level, but also in a social level. What, what does it mean to um, provide social infrastructure? So for instance, we work with women that do washing like laundry for a living. So they gain extra um, income from that. And now, now what they have to do is they have to walk all the way to the river and sometimes they do it at night and it's uh, badly illuminated. So they, have, they suffer accidents. And the same for children that uh, bathe in the river. So what we do is like a communal infrastructure that serves in the provision of water and sanitation, but that also provides 
a communal space where those activities that are communal in the first place can happen. So it's a matter of like providing more representation, but also those spaces where solidarity, care, community can be preserved and, and strengthened over time. Um, and I think that's one of the main, uh, but going back to the limitations, it's like that holistic or integrated view um, of, of the, the, all the dimensions that come across uh, access to water is what we need to like break through and introduce into planning um, and, and government, in the government. Belinda. To piggyback off of that, what has come out, so we've only done the first phase of our Indonesia Peru research because of COVID, but we were able to have a remote team do our qualitative data or the team's uh, qualitative data collection in Sumba, Indonesia. And what came out a lot was, you know, a group comes in, they do some projects, the infrastructure breaks, it doesn't, it doesn't get fixed. And so you have these efforts that um, ultimately don't lead to the, the results that you want. And another piece that we're really interested in understanding is how do you support women in becoming part of water management, water policy, these infrastructure interventions? And Belen, my question for you is, in the design of these amazing um, spaces for women, you know, are there places for women to contribute how that comes together, what they need. Can you tell us a little bit about the participant, if there is a participatory piece of that design? Um, yeah, like for instance, we didn't even know we were gonna do uh, a laundry. Uh, we just knew that we had funding to provide or like experiment with rainwater collection systems and like break the, the like the cycle of like feature the depuration and like all the cleansing of the water. But we did this uh, transect walks in the streets of uh, the community. First understanding that there's different trajectories of men, women, and children, how they use the streets. So mostly men go out and, and fish or uh, into the fields to, to work and women and children are the ones that stay and like do multiple routes throughout the day. Uh, is it like for domestic activities inside the houses, for selling the fish outside in a, a market stands by the street or for this, uh, laundry uh, activities. So it's like a communal decision with them and actually by them. It's like, okay, we are going to provide that rainwater collection system. Like where should it be located? Like we knew for instance, that we wanted to do it um, in communal. So we didn't want to install uh, private uh, water collection systems inside the houses because we want to promote a sense of community. Um, and little by little, like we designed, like there was a component of urban design and like systemic design of integrating the pier, um, the market stands and laundry and I call it like showers and services. But uh, we decided to go for like the first, uh, for the laundry system, but chosen by the people. And then actually in the building process, men participated by women as well in how it's like that is integrated into communal space. So like choosing the heights of the benches, for instance, or like the amount of shade and how to illuminate it during that night, but also in the maintenance of it. So like after we left, how is this, that space kept uh, and who's in, who in the community is in charge of doing that? And we wanted to emphasize the role of women in doing that um, also as a sense of, well, first, because there's the one that you should use it the most because men leave um, during the day, but also to provide them like more spaces for a political leadership within the community and recognition. That's really, and Belen, that reminds me of Shaleen's, um, some of her methods that she used in Kenya. The transect walks reminded me a little bit, Shaleen, of uh, your go along, the, the method of go along. Maybe you could tell us sure. a little bit about so that. So it is what it sounds like. Um, you go along with the participant while they're engaging in an activity of interest. So for example, we were interested in um, how women were gathering water and sort of um, the toll that it might take on them. So we, we had um, trained research assistants walk along with women wearing a recorder um, and just having conversation about, um, about water in general while they were you know, sort of thinking about it and, and engaging in it. So um, the research assistants and I would walk to the river, you know, get the water and walk back to the household um, and just have a casual conversation. And then um, from that you know, conversation, you can pick out key themes. Um, and that really helped guide a lot of our work. 
um, in Kenya. And the, the whole um, participation of women, but how do we get more women involved in the decision making that's going to transform or not their lives? How did you manage to persuade the people that um, women had to be included in the discussions? Um, because we, we, you know, we found time and again, people say, oh, they don't want to, they're too busy, or they're not interested, they don't talk, even if they do come. Um, it, and it, um, how, how do you persuade people of the need to have the women there at the table when the decisions are made? Is that a question for like? Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> it's so hard well, working I, out who's, who's going to talk next. Um, well, Bill, you you mentioned the multidimensional nature, and Stroma, you and I had had conversations about what multidimensionality means in these research action projects, and we had thought about it in a slightly different way about how you think about the multidimensional nature of access points for participation. And so in Sumba, Indonesia, we found that it's not just necessarily the government who's involved in water policy and management, that the church is involved, that there are NGOs and that there are, for example, women's organizations and that working with multiple actors, not just the one that might immediately come to mind can potentially facilitate the involvement of women but I don't know how to address your, your main piece about people saying that women or, don't have or, time. Or, or actually yeah. hearing their voices rather than just saying that they have a voice. We know they have a voice, but it's hearing their voice and making changes according to those voices. Well, I think at the micro level, right, we can think about some of these um, qualitative methods that we can contribute as, um, as you know, investigators, as researchers, like photo voice, for example, um, is a participatory method where you give people cameras. I know that um, Paula, you have engaged in it, um, but you give people cameras and you ask them to take pictures about something and they come back and they talk to you about what the most important things they took pictures of were. And then um, the purpose of that is to build collective action and bring attention to um, issues that people themselves identify in their communities. So I think, you know, sort of, from the, the research level, that's what we can we can do. We can use methods that amplify the voices of the participants that we're working with um, to address these problems. But I think on the macro level, getting women in governance, right? If, yeah. um, if people who are actively involved in, um, in, in trying to solve an issue at the ground level don't feel like they have um, the amplification that they need to, to fix a problem, getting those people in power so that they can fix the problem, I think is really, you know, because a lot of the issues with infrastructure are um, are governmental, and so you know, getting women in government um, and and sort of reducing um, gender inequities and building more gender parity. And just being devil's advocate, we have the problem of urban rural. So we have we we've got urban women who actually don't have the lived experience of the rural women and don't believe that the rural women have the education levels or the confidence. Um, to, you know, one of the things that the good things that came out of our, our first phase of research was getting those townswomen to do out into the to the field doing the research and have their eyes opened to the huge problems but largely speaking they're not the women who are getting into any kind of decision making positions are women who have already were born in the towns have only ever lived town life which you know I'm not I'm not saying they live a life of luxury or anything like that but they certainly don't understand the hardships that the rural women are putting up with having to deal with on a daily basis the lived experiences of rural women are very far removed from and and they do have we have found this real urban rural divide in terms of their attitudes to women's abilities to take part to have enough interest to um yeah um be able to be activists 
So just to, to build on that in, in two different ways. So in the second phase of our research in Indonesia, we'll be hosting participatory workshops where we bring women within these local communities together to discuss how they envision improving these situations. And the piece here, and what we I did in a, a prior project with Gabriella, our other team member with Photo Voice, is it's also about taking the stories, taking the photos, taking the voices of women and make sure, making sure it's connected to stakeholders who are m moving and shaking. And so Stroma, to speak to your point about the urban rural divide, it's bringing urbanites into these rural communities so that they can see the issues firsthand, they can speak to the people and they can work together to understand what are the local needs and what are the possibilities via governance. And then the second point is, you know, I, I think that sometimes that women don't have time could be just an excuse to exclude women, but it's also reality. We know that women are walking hours to, to go get water and then they don't have enough water to do their household, um, I'm not gonna use the word duties, but sure. the, the, the things that they need, to, the, cho the chores within the household. And so how can we consider our cross-cultural knowledge of what's going on in these different places in Africa, in Peru, in Indonesia. And are there any, again, I don't want to use the word adaptation, but ways to mitigate the stresses that unequally fall upon women? What are the, and Shaleen, you and I talked about this a little bit, about what are the traditional forms of social support and reciprocity, acknowledging that these are unique to particular contexts, but also with an eye towards can that this fit in different places? And I know in Peru, uh, the Minga, which is a communal work party, is often used to bring water for any of the needs of, of the water needs of the schools. You know, how does that exactly translate to helping people within different households is something to be thought through. But Shaleen, maybe you can comment on specifically those um, systems of rep reciprocity for women who are in who are pregnant or in the postpartum period. Sure, yeah. So um, what we found in Kenya is that um, women sort of build these, these structures of social support that they can engage in later. And there's a lot of social reciprocity in resource insecurity generally. So um, you may, you know, rely on your neighbor to give you, like if you think about just if you have a neighbor, you can go get a cup of flour if you're baking cookies or something, right? Um, it's sort of the same thing. And then that neighbor might come to you later and be like, oh, well, I need like two eggs, you know, because I ran out. So build Building these like structures of social reciprocity um, becomes extremely important in communities that are resource insecure because it creates a social safety net um, that you can access those resources in times of scarcity, so or even severe scarcity. And there are um, there's a lot of literature about um, how these systems beca can become really stressed if. Um, people in the community have a lot and other people have less, um, and then those people there's sort of like the inherent. Um, reliance on people who have more, um, but that can, those systems can kind of break down in severe, severe resource scarcity, like droughts, that sort of thing. But overall, I think um, people generally rely on one another to meet resource needs, especially in, um, in, in times when they really, really need to access those resources. So um, in Kenya, when women are in very late pregnancy, we're talking like eight months, nine months, um, very, very late pregnancy. Um, and immediately after delivery, sometimes fetching water from a source that's two hours away from you and carrying it for your household is just, it's completely unrealistic. Um, so women do rely on their neighbors, on their friends, on their family members. Um, sometimes um, children of, of their fa of family or friends um, to go get water for them, to make sure that they have enough water for their needs. And then um, also a topic that came up um, pretty frequently in my um, conversations with women in Kenya, Kenya is that they would just say, you know, I helped my sister when she was delivering, I got her water. So, you know, she brought more for me when I delivered. Um, and then of course, in the immediate postpartum period, not only are you just, you need to rest as a woman, right? After having delivered but um with your baby like tiny babies require a lot of water right you need water for washing you need water for changing clothes um for just keeping yourself clean so that you feel um safe and secure feeding your baby um women have talked about you know feeling dehydrated so they can't breastfeed um and um i think asher rosinger pr presented really good information about that um in the amazon about you know dehydration and lactation and so you can see how um the social reciprocity is really important. So even in thinking about building collective efficacy to advocate um, as a group, I think leveraging these um, networks to sort of like leveraging
encouraging them and bolstering them so that people do feel like they have a communal voice in communities where they feel most comfortable, I think is, is really important in addressing um, access to water specifically. And Chilean, I think what you're saying is really highlighting also this multi-dimensional approach that we've been referencing and, you know, thinking on the household level, how do you get taps in the households or close by the households to make it easier for the households, then going up to the family social network level, then Belen, like with your work where you're on the local level and you're creating this infrastructure and then going one level above and how do you empower women to be a voice within governance? And so... I think you constantly have to be thinking on these different uh, in a scaffolded way to really be able to address this issue, which is only is getting worse. Right. And so what we heard often in Indonesia is, OK, well, you can have this, you know, water harvesting, this, that and the other. But the droughts are getting to be Stroma. You can comment on this. How long out of the year where it used to be about half the year, but now it's getting to be the eight months. It's moved from six months over to eight months of the year of um, no yeah. rain. No rain, and the groundwater is, is and big. yeah, the the groundwater is getting deeper or um, to, to to points where you can't um, reach it, and the springs are drying up. And of course, this is all you know part of climate change, as we all right. know. Um, and quite a few people are cognizant of the fact it's also due to not protecting the forests and the springs and deforestation um, and um, animals that have, you know, well, you know when, when you can't give water to your animals, but you let them loose, then they um, further def the deforestation process quicker, right, because they go further taking more leaves. Um, so the, the the, the situation is getting worse because of climate change. Um, mm. The situation is also getting worse because of um, other demands. The, the, this year, the demand for all the finances has gone to COVID programmes, so that all the programmes that would have gone to water distribution um, have just been put on hold. Um, and um, also population increase, you know, is, a, is another um, factor um, playing into it becoming more difficult for these women uh, rather than less difficult. I think that's an important piece of the interdisciplinary, the need for interdisciplinary collaborations when it comes to water insecurity and health, women's health as well, is because you have so many factors that are amplifying water insecurity. And then water insecurity is amplifying so many other factors in a syndemic manner where you have this, these interactions between illness and water insecurity and stress that again is, is coming together for the most vulnerable people. And it's for the children who are particularly vulnerable during these critical windows of development, such as the, the first one 1,000 days. And this is going to have intergenerational effects. And I think what we're really interested in is being able to both speak to academic audiences, but also to practitioners and to those who are in governance to make the case for why water insecurity is such a central issue to address and to be thinking creatively. Because if there's a drought and there's no rainwater and the springs and the groundwater is drying up, we're really going to have to be very creative in how we deal with that. And then Belen, I mean, your work is, you're working in a, a, in a water abundant, but not necessarily a um, usable context. And so we're really going to have to take this brainstorming to these different contexts, but with women, I, not to be biased since I'm a woman, but with women uh, playing a central role in figuring out how we go forward with with this and i hear my children in the background misbehaving so just ignore them <laughs> <laughs> Talking about Bellin, did you have um, examples of um, how you were dealing with this from um, your experiences in peru uh, getting the women involved in the decision making getting the government to um let you involve the women in the discussions and the decisions that were being made? Uh, yes, I think, well, to start, we started with um, differentiated um, events like workshops or like one-to-one -one interviews to try to adapt to the availability of women or just like basically following them around while they were doing 
um, their activity. So we didn't want to Did impose, like, one? yeah, exactly. And then um, as we started to recognize what their necessities were, what their capacities were, were as well, we started to um, open up the discussion to more or more people, but they already felt like they had information to give and, 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 and like uh, their voices to be heard. Uh, but another important point, I think, um, and this is probably because I'm an architect, uh, but <laughs> is the, the aesthetic quality uh, and the symbolic quality of like good design and good architecture uh, that also provides uh, a platform for people to feel empowered. So um, it's just not the provision of a well and like a water collection system. Like we actually created a, an, an entire environment uh, for the laundry, but that could also be used for other activities. So all the community discussions um, basically became an open community center where people got together, like for instance, now during the pandemic to like discuss and make decisions. And it was felt by the community that this place belonged to women because there was the one that managed it. Uh, so that also gave them a feeling of empowerment. And also this was recognized um, as good quality design by international architects, etc. So we gained a lot of uh, notice, which also meant that the government started to notice it and they were like, okay, we need, should replicate this kind of infrastructure elsewhere. Um, so what I'm saying, like if there are, it's not only how uh, politically or socially you engage uh, with making people's voices heard or like in this case in particular like women but also like the creation of literally the spaces where those voices can be heard and through that recognition they um, also gain a lot more um, power in decision making processes. And your um, wonderful system only works because of high rainfall right we couldn't replicate that in Kenya or in Sumba. Oh, no, pure. it works also with um, wells uh, in times of like low quantity of rain, but we are investigating also how to provide water and sanitation in places with uh, lower levels of rain, particularly in Lima, which is a desert city with no rain at all. But in that case, another important point that I want to make is like, I think it's not only providing water, uh, but coming up with innovative ways in which to make the uses of that limited amount of water as effective and efficient as possible. Like I'm thinking about in South Africa when they had, I think access to, is it less than 50 liters per day as a family and how they had to really think about how that water is gonna be distributed. Uh, I think part of the process of working with people and then in a multidisciplinary group is engaging with efficient water management at all levels, which is not the provision of it, but how to use it efficiently. And even water oh, recycling oh. as well. Yes, like, yes, exactly. A lot of water recycling in low water households. Um, yes. so to, like harness that, right, and make it make it useful and, and not harmful. Well, we, we had just so many wonderful examples. I mean, there's nothing that we could teach them about water management and more efficient use of water their reuse of water their constant recycling and their use of the same 15 liters you were in, in you were talking about south africa limited to 50 five zero liters we're talking about families limited to 15 one five liters all right um it, it, when they can manage it, they'll get that twice in a day. So they'll get the 30 litres. But quite often they're, they're re relying on the one five. And sometimes that was for their pigs as well. So, you know, after they'd washed and after they'd cooked and then the pigs would get. And, you know, pigs actually like as much water as we do. So um, we've got so much we could learn about water recycling fr from them. I um, efficient water management is not something that I can. <laughs> I was just like <laughs> quite mind blown about how efficiently they use their water. But I'm thinking more about technology that um, is there. Maybe somebody in the audience is aware of some kind of technology that would be appropriate in places where you can't go down 
you can't rely on rain. Uh, what, what, what are the options? Mr. Emma, maybe we should open it up uh, broadly to the audience to... Yes, uh, yeah, I was, um, I, I, was I, I did address that to the audience. I don't know if uh, anybody... Uh, yeah, just to just to contribute yes. to that, or Any if anybody questions has questions, I've asked for those too. Please do um, throw your questions in the chat box, um, and we'll ask them for you. Um, or if you've got any great ideas, um, please share them. Share them with us. Share them with the women around the world. Or Victoria, is there any way so that we could see, uh, I think we still have 12 participants or maybe nine, nine audience members, if, if we could get them on the screen so that we can see them as well. I don't know if that's a possibility with Zoom webinar. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not the technological. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's possible. I can promote everyone to panelists if that works and then everyone can be included on the screen. Oh, right. Would that be okay with everyone? Yeah, sure. Okay. So we can see people if they choose to be seen or heard. Yeah, I guess like one of the main challenges okay. is like the, the seasonality. Mm -hmm. Whereas if it's rainwater or in the case of Lima, people working with like fog catching, um, it's a matter that it only works in a certain um time of the year you can work with possibly reservoirs but like yeah. those take up a lot of space and sometimes that space is not um available but yeah it will be i think it's one of the pending challenges of how to make autonomous self-sufficient uh infrastructures that are not depending on this grid that we know um is very slow to come to some places uh and like doesn't really adapt to some of the territorial characteristics uh, of the places people live. I think, Stroma, we had chatted about the bamboo harvesting. Example. Yes, has anybody um, had any experience of those? The, uh, the bamboo structures that can deliver? Mm -mm. we share one on the screen, do you think, Paula? I think we could, if I can, I have a million. Okay, so it's a bamboo water harvester. It's not, not quite what came up for me, Strum. I don't remember exactly, we had shared it. Oh yes, here we go. Let me share my screen and just ignore the million things I have open. Can everybody see this maybe? That? Yeah, I think like the main thing that I've observed from that uh, example is that I haven't really actually seen it. Is, is that build? I think that's the rendering. So I think. Yeah, um, a lot of uh, most of these types of solution at the moment are very experimental, including my own. Um, and it's also because of this uh, problem, going back to the question on uh, limited and problems um, in finding funding is like most um, government planning and, and, and seeks to have solutions that have already been proven. Uh, but to get to that point, you need to do a lot of experimentation, seeing if it works, uh, collecting data, and that um, needs fun per se. And that sometimes is difficult to have, especially in times like this, uh, where most of the resources uh, are now dealing with a health pandemic. Well, I think something that came up in our qualitative data that we, Strom and I still need to look into is the, the privatization of water. And there were, I think, two companies working in Sumba who, appeared to be taking water from these springs and then bottling it and, and, and selling it. And so a problematic, right? So you're taking a communal good, you're now privatizing it and you're contributing to the cycle of poverty because now people who already have limited economic resources aren't getting their water for, and it's not free, right? But walking that far, that is not a free resource necessarily but now making people pay economically for it. And Shaleen, you have a 
was it an article you were part of? The title was, I think it was like, we buy beans or we buy water. Or we you take the cash mint for beans and you buy water. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a direct quote from one of our participants. Um, that's it's very common, especially in, in areas where you kind of have to decide sometimes, you know, if you, if you don't have the time to walk two hours to get water, sometimes you have to go to the water vendor and pay for water, which, but it might mean that, you know, you have to reduce other household resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So who is letting these companies draw from these springs? Something to find out. Is that an ethical thing to do? Again, lots of power going on, et cetera. But if these companies are going to continue to operate, how can they give back to the communities by for example, supporting some of the research that can go into, you know what I mean? Like you don't want to just put a Band-Aid on the problem, but then you also don't want to um, be overly ambitious saying that we're going to stop the um, privatization of water. When it comes to the privatization of water, you know, I, I do think that um, first world activism can have quite a big impact on these more remote destinations that we're talking about. Um, one of the biggest privatizers of water in Indonesia is Danone. And Danone is a French company. It's one of you know, the world's 10 biggest food manufacturers. Um, and it's got its fingers in many pies. And um, you know, ultimately, it's us buying our yogurt um, in the West that is supporting um, their efforts um, el elsewhere um, and trying to hold these companies to account, um, I think, is, a, is another part of this issue. I don't think that we just have to see this as, you know, a little remote issue in Sumba or in a part of Kenya or a part of Peru. Do you know what I mean? It is very much about the interconnectedness of the world. And it's very much about um, who's getting the big slice of the pie. And when it comes to the privatization of water, we do know that it's multinational corporations that are behind them, even in very, very remote places. Right. Nestle is another one. Um, Coca-Cola. Uh, if you go anywhere, everywhere I've been in the world, Coca-Cola is within, you know, a few walking feet. Yeah. In rural areas, refugee set settlements, I've seen Coca-Cola, right? And just, there you go, Coca-Cola. <laughs> but I think the, uh, as much as the critique is necessary here for the, the dynamics that unfold with the global multinational companies, I think it's also maybe about inviting representatives to attend these participatory workshops in, in, in whatever way you can, because what's the saying? You, you catch more supplies or honey. No, bees? Catch more bees with honey than with vinegar? Is that the saying? <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that saying. But um, when it comes to Danone and their privatization of water in Indonesia, I have done nothing but be nice to them to try and get them to engage before yeah. I've decided that um, getting angry is probably more useful. <laughs> yeah, here I am. Are these rose colored glasses that I'm that I'm wearing here? <laughs> Uh, just naivete but um fantastic so should we we're at the the top of the hour i think um any voices from the audience analia caitlin sanjev Ana we've got a hand from analia analia do you want to yeah. uh please put Hi everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your discussion because it has been extremely interesting. Um, I'm, I, I wanted to share a little bit about what some of the things that came up to my mind as I was listening to the conversation. And I think one of them relates directly to the type of work that I have been doing as part of the team of researchers within a multilateral organization when it comes to water. And, and especially related to this last part of the conversation in terms of who, who gets to decide what, when, and where. Um, and I think that part of what I find interesting to discuss and to figure out as researchers, but also from the pract practitioner's perspective, is how to make these nuances and issues much more visible. And I think part of the, the issue that I have found myself work, working around is the, the use of data, what data is available, like what, 
how data is collected in a way that makes some things more visible than others and how a lot of the current systems benefit from that. So I was finding extremely interesting uh, hearing your experiences uh, in the field and doing, doing more of the qualitative work. I myself tend to do more quantitative or like mixed methods. And so um, I think that there is so much richness in all of the information, the data and the experiences that you have gathered. And yet I get the sense that for a lot of people and especially practitioners, it sort of like gets lost in the process for them, either because they want a technical note that it's very straightforward or because they just focus on the one like project that they're working on and the insights that they got from there. And so it's both a comment and a question that I would like to discuss simply because I think part of the challenge is how to move past the information that we have always replicated and talked about and more into a better informed policy making that really gets at the heart of what we're trying to do. Um, one example that I can give you is, uh, especially with, when it comes to time, um, like so the allocation of time. I have been trying testing out some questions for getting more data on like how people allocate their time and the intra-household negotiations related to water. Um, and I, I am certain it's not going to capture everything, but at the same time, it might get us closer to having a, a clearer understanding of how much time is allocated, especially in the region that we work in, in Latin America. Um, and so th those are the kind of things that as a researcher, I have been sort of like going around and relate to your discussions, but I just wanted to bring it to the table. And Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. And that is one of the reasons why our project was mixed methods. It was both the survey, which is HYS plus gender-based violence. So we used the HYS 12 questions and then we created our own um, gender-based violence survey, which hopefully we can shrink and tighten with um, multiple uses of it so it becomes useful for other people rather than being a long survey. But, and that was specifically because um, Oxfam was one of the um, supporters of the work and they said they needed numbers as well as stories, that their funders, that policy makers, they want what percentage of women this, what how many hours do they really walk, how many litres do they carry, you know, they want the numbers to support the stories. And I'm a, a qualitative, I'm an anthropologist, you know, I sit and I chat and I listen to people, but I realize that when you stick pie charts in front of governments, they listen, <laughs> and when you stick stories in front of them, they switch off, you know? And, and that's mainly, you know, it might be a male, female brain thing, you know, that, um, or it, it might just be a fact that they, they find it easier to digest numbers. I don't really understand, but they like bar charts and pie charts and numbers. And um, if that's what they want to change their mind, that's what we've got to give them. And I would like to take a minute to speak to the HY scale. So I was the senior project coordinator to develop the HY scale, which is a household water and security experience scale. It's very similar to um, what you would, a traditional you know, list of survey questions with um, frequency of um, experience. So it's experientially based at the household level, which we understand does have some limitations. Um, there's also a four item version of the scale. So much of the qualitative work um, that I've spoken about today is sort of fed into that process and a lot of qualitative work um, fed into the process of developing this HWISE tool that was then implemented um, in multiple sites, like more than 20 sites across the world um, to develop this nice, you know, scale that we can use that um, is being used by the UN, by Gallup, um, by a lot of implementing partners. Um, as a public health practitioner, that is also super important to me. I'm a very mixed methods, um, I'm, I'm classical training and quantitative methods and then um, on the ground training and qualitative methods. So um, thinking from a mixed methods perspective is really important, but um, I can say that, you know, if, if you're looking for a quick way to measure water insecurity at a household level that's really compelling, the HY scale does a really good job. Um, and it was through multiple iterations of, of um, scale development and, um, and use that we were able to build the tool. And we, you know, had the unique experience of collaborating with, with 
people who are doing fantastic work across very different types of settings. And Stroma um, was part of the HWISE um, data collection in Indonesia. We collected data um, in Iran. We collected data sort of um, in, in South and Central America and, and in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. So um, I just want, I mean, I know I don't want to, you know, promote my own work too much, but it's, it's a really exciting tool that we feel like has a lot of promise for practitioners. And just to to think forward, right? Like we can do all these fantastic things we should, but we also need to be training young people yes. to be broadly trained in mixed methods, to be able to do anthropological research, but also do the quantitative data collection, to be able to speak across disciplines and speak in a way that doesn't exclude people who are not academics. And also, you know, we, we have to be forward facing. We have to start bringing more young people in into the fold so that they can learn these skills both in the classroom, but bringing them into the field. And so how do we do these immersive trainings and then teach them just basic communication because we've got lots of smart people who don't always communicate what needs to be communicated to have the policy um, move forward. And so, Analia, we would love to um, hear more about the organizations that you're working with, what the type of data that you're looking for is so that we can better understand how to collect our data and how to frame our data, package it up in a, in, in a way that it is most useful for the people who are actually enacting policies um, in these multilateral organizations. So I wrote down your, your name, we'll definitely be uh, sending you an email. And, and and we just really also we just need to keep crossing boundaries. I mean, you know, anthropologists with call it with public health people, with architects, with engineers. You know, it, it's that, that that's needed for this planet to you know, for, for for the women out there that are struggling for water, but for all of us from the you know considering the the state of our planet if we don't start talking across disciplines and learning to to speak each other's language and work together in very creative ways i mean that's one of the beauties of belen's thing it's like the creative side of it um rather than just the the, the science side of things i think is absolutely critical for the future of the planet um and i really want to get that over to our students as well mm. that um link with creative types um, for, for the for future. Um, I, I would like to reinforce that point. I myself do not, like I, I did not have a background in water and sanitation before starting my current job. I come from political science and political economy and gender. So I think that the more my own exploration and learning continues, the more I, I think it's like, it's a key point, the multidisciplinary approach to it, to really understand all the angles and perspectives that, that we require to really do a good job when it comes to policy making. Yeah, and I think we have to be very clear to our students, what are the job options from this? Because sometimes I think people can get so such a, an interdisciplinary training that it's like, well, what am I going to become, right? So you don't want to silo people into one particular discipline, but also to acknowledge that we have to think about studies to careers so that people can actually support themselves from from being very broad being very very broad yeah, and, and then from the point of view of hopes for academics i mean we wouldn't have got the british academy funding had it not been a team of four people from four different disciplines um because funding now requires um, interdisciplinary teams to work together for creative solutions to uh the problems that face us so um stretching your arms across to um, to others i think is is really critically important and getting our students to learn why that's important um too so stretching our arms to everyone else does anyone else have a question or any um piece that they would like to contribute well, um going back to, to the data and the mixed methods so i also think there's um a level of creativity in how the data is shown and why it's collected in the first place. Uh, so for instance, uh, we knew that we wanted to have some kind of political impact, not necessarily with the municipality, but perhaps with like the, the health ministry. So how do you show that this infrastructure is beneficial? And we know that the main thing that politicians care about is money and votes. 
So we collected like how much money are you saving by providing infrastructure that reduces the exposure to diseases like dengue instead of like having people having to go to the hospital because they didn't get it. Um, and in terms of like municipalities, it's like by them being involved, carrying out a survey of like how people think about you, like the percentage of acceptance and did it go in up or no, like after you provided this infrastructure. Um, and then if you wanted to like run for a second um, tenure, would you be able to get it or not? So I think that's also, Perhaps that part is not particularly important for us, like the economic benefits of doing this or like the political gain. But I think if you want to engage with multiple partners, you have to think of what kind of benefits they are gonna get from participating in this. And perhaps you end up um, getting involved with partners that you didn't consider in the first place. So we ended up working with the Ministry of Health um, even though we don't even have a doctor in the team, uh, but it's just like the matter of like then how um, we were able to provide this evidence of um, perhaps a preventive measure of um, healthcare instead of like a post, like a reactive measure to one of the main problems that they face in, in the Amazon rainforest. Belen, I vote for you. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, um, Andrea uh, Smith, the question. You got your hand up. Yeah. Hey. Um, I'm a doctoral student in the tropical medicine department at Tulane. Um, hey. <laughs> I, um, I'm doing my dissertation on the intersection of gender and wash. Um, one of my aims looks at um, like maternal ideations and psychosocial factors and how that influences the treatment of diarrheal disease in kids. Um, another one of my aims, I wanna look at the determinants of diarrheal disease um, in the setting. Now the, the, uh, the population that the project is working with are pregnant women and uh, women who have a child under the age of two, and we don't have any qualitative data, it's all quantitative. But mm. what I, one of the other things that I wanted to look at was how WASH infrastructure could influence empowerment um, and through what avenues does that happen. Um, but I guess one of the things that I'm not struggling with, but curious about are the quantitative methods that could be um, harnessed for that. I was thinking like path modeling or um, structural equation modeling, that sort of thing. Um, and then my other question too is how, how can we measure empowerment? Mm. I, mean, I know that that's gonna look different in different communities. Like for us, we're working in Northwestern Nigeria and you know, empowerment there is going to look a lot different than empowerment here. Um, so I don't know if anybody had comments on that or thoughts. Um, I, 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 if I may, I did uh, that exactly that quick. How do you measure empowerment and how would we how would we know? I was working in Tanzania with um, an amazing group of women who actually I'm still working with them. But when I went out there, it was, I, it was a project and it was to empower people. So then three years later, how would I know if I had empowered anybody or not, right? How would I know if the project was in the least bit empowering or not? Um, so I decided to get the women to decide for themselves. Um, and, um, we um, did it by you know getting them to discuss it and then for them to rank it so and then they could um, talk about where they were now and then in three years time we could measure where they were at um, and uh, number number one on their list was um, for their daughters education which is quite difficult to measure in three years but you know that their their daughters be able to provide for their daughters to have an education. You know that their daughters wouldn't be stuck in the same cycle that they were in. And the second was freedom from gender-based violence. 
Um, and because that was so high on their lists of empowerment, um, we decided to aim the project at that um, and work with um, a human rights charity who would work within the village and all we needed, what they believed needed to do, and it's been shown to be the case, would take one man to court, you know, take one brave woman who will take it through the courts, have him locked away six months to a year, and it cures gender-based violence for within three years in that village because nobody else dares. But of course, she's, you know, wh when we talk to these women in summer, why don't you report it? One of the reasons is they lose their economy, right? So when you say support that woman, it's not, it's support her socially, psychologically, right? In every single way, but then financially for the entire time to know. So the organization that I work for, we constantly charity raise money. Um, for that so that but it, it, it works you only have to put one guy away in the village and then you know it has a knock-on effect that the other men fear that they're going to get Tanzanian jails are pretty horrible places to end up so um, you know they don't want to go there and that when they know that there's eyes watching them and there's this organization that says that's going to support their women to do it this is off the back of an agricultural project for tourism, by the way. But what I'm just saying was, you said, how do you measure empowerment? Go and ask them to rank what they believe and then use those measures. So, Andrea, I think, uh, you know, if you're primarily trained in quantitative methods and, you know, within your PhD, expanding into the qualitative data realm is like too much because you, you don't want to take off on too much. I mean, are there any social scientists who are at Tulane who are potentially, or how big is your team, for example, that's working in, you said, Northwestern Nigeria? Yeah, so the, um, it's, there's a consortium of, of people that are working um, or organizations that are working. There's POP Council. Um, our funding comes from USAID, obviously Tulane. Um, I think I'm probably leaving some people out. I know that I am, um, but the the data that I have right now is cross-sectional survey data. I wanted to collect some qualitative data. I wanted to do focus group discussions um, and maybe some key uh, key person interviews, but that idea wasn't funded through through USAID. So right now, all I have is baseline cross-sectional data, and the, the project isn't. A wash project. It's a uh, geared towards um, like maternal and child health, family planning, that sort of thing. So I'm I'm trying to carve out a little piece for myself. Um, the project's been underway. Midline data collection should be happening um, in a few months. So then I'll have baseline and midline data. Um, but I'm I guess I'm just. It's hard to yeah empowerment of. It's like well-being. Hard to measure. I do have, um, if you'd like, I have a colleague um, that we worked together at Northwestern. She um, did a project on um, women's empowerment in um, agriculture, doing a, a farmer training school um, type model. And um, she's done a lot of work on trying to look at proxy measures of empowerment, um, like women's access to income, that sort of thing that you can pull from DHS type data or sort of like USAID survey type data. Um, if you would, if you want me to connect you with her, um, she's a great resource and She's very quant um, focused. So she might be a good person to talk to, even you know, talking through some of the path modeling. Um, she has quite a bit of training in structural equation modeling um, and path analyses and things. If you if you want to be connected, I'd love to connect you. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Good friends to have who oh, yeah. are, are well well trained <laughs> yeah, yeah. in structural equation model. <laughs> she was very good. Not... She's amazing. <laughs> I, I just always fear anybody who uses income as a proxy for empowerment, but um, we, that, that's probably a debate we need to have for another day. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was, gonna, I was actually going to say the same thing because I was asked to review a, a paper that exactly used basically income and a couple of other more or less measures of socioeconomic status as measures of empowerment. And 
you know, I was going to like, blah, you know, but you have to balance, you know, if you're not, you, know, to- you know, women in, in positions of power with women, you know, on village councils, women in regional councils, um, women who are head of organizations, you know, you could, uh, are off, you know, power and empowerment, the word power t- says it all. It's about politics, you know, so uh, rather than income. Okay. Shaleen, thank you for offering to, to make those sure. connections. I think it would be yes. fantastic if we could have a, a group email. Um, does anybody else have anything they would like to sneak in? I think we're, Stroma, tell me, did we have an hour and a half slotted for this? or was I it think we had an hour. So we've, we've gone <laughs> we're only up. half an hour into the hour that I'd allocated. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but, but, do, any more for any more? Caitlin, Analia, Sanjev, Andreza. Any more contributions before I thank very much um, the three discussants? Thank you to HWISE for organising it. Um, Victoria there um, standing in. Um, I've learned things. I hope you've all learned things. Continue the conversation. We're all here at the end of an email. If you've got more questions you want to ask, um, don't hesitate. And um, I hope we can continue the discussion um, on another occasion. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everybody. Nice to meet you.